this week on the Back Table Podcast. The advantage to the uterosacral ligament approach is that it preserves a natural axis of the vagina, whereas the sacrospinous ligament fixation stays extraperitoneal. It deviates the vaginal axis laterally and can cause buttock pain for up to six weeks. For post-hysterectomy patients, I'll offer either sacrospinous ligament fixation or laparoscopic sacral copepexy. For the high posterior prolapse, I actually think the sacrospinous ligament fixation works great. My approach is to take a diamond from the top and then just measure with Alice's, make sure that it goes up to the sacrospinous ligament and then shorten the vagina to where it doesn't just write on the sacrospinous ligament because I think it's the length that's very important there. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Backtable Urology Podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. This is Jose Ochesilva, your host this week. We are happy to have as guest Dr. Amy Park. Dr. Park obtained a bachelor's degree from Brown University, then went on to study medicine at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. She then completed her residency training in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Pittsburgh, Maggie Women's Hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, followed by her fellowship in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive pelvic surgery at Cleveland Clinic. Currently, she's the section head of female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. Welcome to Back Table, Amy. Thank you, Jose. So how's the weather in Cleveland? Actually, it's pretty good. I'm pretty happy. It's like my... You can't beat summers in Cleveland, but you can beat the winters. It's pretty cold here, but the summers are, are awesome. Now here in Orlando, during the day, it's like 120 degrees. I mean, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm making it up, but very, very hot. And then around six or seven storms every day. So you get just right now it's pouring outside. So it's, it's just crazy weather here uh, during the summer. So Amy, so... so you're doing a uh, female reconstruction of pelvic medicine uh, uh, in Cleveland Clinic. So let's talk about incontinence and a little bit of prolapse. Sure. How about that? Perfect. So I do uh, uh, some incontinence in the office. Uh, I don't do prolapse, but patients call the office saying, ah, my, my PCP tells that my bladder is fallen. And at first I didn't give them appointment because I don't do like the, the fallen bladder or, or prolapse. But most of the time it's just incontinence. So I started seeing them all the time, uh, and most of them is just incontinence, not prolapse. So what symptoms do patients with an actual prolapse right, present? Well, typically patients with prolapse present with sensation of vaginal bulge, pelvic pressure, something coming out of the vagina, splinting, which is pushing on the vagina in order to urinate or defecate completely. Sometimes they can have painful sex. Exactly. And, and most of the time they're just coming, I mean, I, at least in my practice, definitely. They come for, for incontinence. I mean, sometimes they do feel the, the, the bulb coming out. Are you doing pelvic exam on, on, on that first visit on everyone? Yeah, I think that the most important part is the history, obviously. And, you know, that's where I can really glean whether or not people have stress incontinence, urgent incontinence, symptomatic prolapse. You know, I don't really, this is a quality of life issue, so I don't really need to treat it if it's not bothersome to the patient. I do do a, a pelvic exam on the first visit for everybody, unless they're an adolescent, in which case I'll just go by symptoms or image with MRI or something like that. Otherwise, I will assess the neurologic function in the S2 through 4 distribution. You know, they're really like ankle ref reflexes. So if they're absent, it's no cause for worry. But if they're present, it's reassuring that the reflex arc is, uh, is intact. It's mostly useful if it's asymmetric, which indicates nerve damage on the side of the absent reflex. I also perform a pelvic exam using the pelvic organ prolapse quantification system, or POPQ, in order to assess the extent of prolapse. The other great grading system is the Bainan-Walker system or the halfway system. And that's like if the leading edge of prolapse comes halfway down the vagina or to the hymen or uh, halfway or all the way out. The bottom line is when the leading edge of prolapse is at the hymen, that's usually the threshold at which people start feeling the symptoms. And then I also perform a speculum exam to assess the cervix, uterus, and nexa, as well as a rectal exam. And I also have patients perform the cough stress test. Also part of my evaluation, I check a urine dip 
just to make sure they don't don't have a urinary tract infection and a post-void residual volume via bl bladder scan. If it's elevated, I will perform a straight cath, but most of the time I just do an ultrasound for patient comfort's sake. Okay. You mentioned the the ankle reflex. So let's say if, if it's abnormal on one side, does it push you directly to some sort of treatment or, or what happens next? Usually I just, if they have an absent reflex on one side, usually they've had a significant event like pelvic surgery or radiation or some sort of traumatic birth injury, and they have something that goes along with it. As long as they don't have any problems with the paresthesias, it's usually doesn't really change my management that much, but I just note it just so I can document it. And then also in case something happens after surgery, you always want to demonstrate that it pre-existed prior to the surgery. Actually, this is sort of a tangent, but when I was a fellow, we did a study looking, it was a prospective cohort, assessed patients for neurologic injury after gynecologic surgery. And, and a lot of people had pre-existing neurologic conditions or numbness or uh, weakness or some sort of abnormalities. So I think it's important to document. Yeah. So they don't blame you afterwards. Especially yeah, yeah. <laughs> after complaining of pelvic pain afterwards, after any type of surgery. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So in terms of cystoscopy and your dynamics for incontinence, what are you looking for when you do a cystoscopy? Are you doing cystoscopy on everyone or, or not, not really? Well, in terms of preoperative procedures, you know, cystoscopy or your dynamics, my short answer is that I'm selective. You know, when I first started practicing, I did your dynamics and cystostil for essentially everyone with overactive bladder or urgent incontinence. But now I just empirically start OEB meds for urinary urgency symptoms, which correlates with what most people do, unless they have a UTI or elevated post void residual. And I'll treat the UTI first or just work up the elevated post void residual with other things. I usually reserve urodynamics for those patients who've had prior anti incontinence procedures like a birch cobalt suspension or a sling, or they have underlying neurologic conditions like stroke or multiple sclerosis, they failed prior OAB meds, or the history is not quite clear whether or not they have stress or urgent continence. Say they have continuous leakage of urine or their history just doesn't go with either of them. And then I also routinely perform your dynamics preoperatively for those patients who have not demonstrated stress incontinence on their pelvic exam. But, uh, you know, there was a big NIH-funded trial called the VALUE trial. For those patients who have stress incontinence or stress-predominant mixed urinary incontinence, if you have a positive cost stress test, normal post void residual less than 150 cc's, and a normal urine tip, there's no added value or benefit or change in outcomes with complex channel urodynamics. And then for cystoscopy, I'll perform that if a patient has a history of a prior anti-incontinence procedure, like I said, a mesh sling or birch or MMK's cobalt suspension, or if the patient has failed OAB meds and is going for Botox. But then I'll just perform the, the bladder and urethral cystoscopic survey at the time of Botox. I, don't, I used to do urodynamics and cystoscopy and then have them come back for the Botox, but the vast majority of the time, it's normal at the time of Botox, so I just save them that extra cysto. Have you had a patient where you go in and it has a small mass or something? I have very occasionally, but I mean, it's so rare. I think I just see a different patient population, which is, I think, more low risk than the typical urologists. But, you know, as you know, most of the time those present with a little bit of hematuria or, or at least something. But very occasionally I've seen some early stage transitional cell or, you know, urothelial cancers, but nothing, it's pretty rare. And is the patient more satisfied if you go straight into cysto with Botox rather than going to cysto first and then another cysto with Botox? Have you seen a difference? No, I haven't asked them. I just uh, assume it's more comfortable. Because I always think about it. I, I haven't done it, but I always think about it. Hey, w w why do this twice? I mean, like, like you said, most of the time there's really nothing and you end up going to do the same thing again. Yeah. I mean, I I rarely find something, you know. I, sometimes I just find that they have a lot of trabeculations, which is kind of what I would have expected anyway, but I don't usually find anything bad like a 
mass or cancer. And then I will if the patient has, for sure, if the patient has had like a prior mesh sling, because I have seen occasional mesh erosions into the bladder, but otherwise I don't do it for just refractory urge and they failed anticholinergics and mere background or something like that. And for, for patients that have stress inc- or, or any type of incontinence, and when you do the pelvic exam, they don't have symptoms of prolapse, but there's a little bit of prolapse there. Uh, let's say POP zero or, or minus one, not that much that is not going into uh, outside the, the vaginal area. When do you decide to treat the prolapse also when you're treating the incontinence? So that's a really good question. There was a study looking at this like ancillary data with some of the NIH funded studies on prolapse and incontinence. And basically for those patients who have stage two prolapse, which is right around the hymen, and some of them are symptomatic and some of them don't, there's not really a big progression in the prolapse. And my take is there are some sequelae to treating prolapse surgically. It's rare, but I don't want to risk dyspareunia, number one. And number two, you really can't improve on no symptoms. So I tend to not treat prolapse, asymptomatic prolapse, unless they, for some reason, have some something else that's pushing me, like they have abnormal uterine bleeding and I might as well do a hysterectomy at the same time and then I'll do a prolapse repair. Or they have some incomplete bladder emptying and it's like prolapse-related voiding dysfunction, but otherwise I don't treat asymptomatic prolapse. Because sometimes I see for slings uh, patients that have seen all urologists and they already have the workup and they scale it directly to me for, for surgery. And when I'm there, I see a little bit of prolapse. So I, I don't know. Oh, I mean, is it the prolapse or I don't do this thing? And, and for now, I haven't had any problems, but I always have the doubt whether they needed more treatment. I mean, at least for now, it hasn't happened, but always curious, when do you actually treat the prolapse? Yeah. And I think that that was definitely more of a question before that I had. Like, you see it coming down a little bit and you're like, oh, should I? just deal with it at the time of surgery. But honestly, the slings work better in the setting of urethral hypermobility. So if you really push it back, it, they don't actually work as well because the mechanism of the sling is really a backstop against which the urethra can compress with the hypermobility. So I actually think the sling may work a little bit better if they have a little bit of prolapse, but you don't want it to be obstructive. And that's the thing that people worry about is when it gets to that point where You wonder, "Mm, if it comes out some more, is it going to be a problem for their emptying? That's when I think you just have to judge and see. But a lot of people with advanced prolapse still are able to empty completely. Okay. So in terms of pelvic floor exercises, let's say a patient with stress incontinence, but also symptomatic prolapse. Is there a, I mean, do pelvic floor do anything or really you just need to treat the prolapse and the incontinence? Well, I think pelvic floor PT is very good at addressing urge incontinence, levator spasm, and pelvic plane. I think it's imperative to have a partnership with pelvic floor physical therapists. The caveat to pelvic floor PT for addressing urge is that patients have to keep up with the exercises. The physical therapists are also very good at addressing the underlying causes for levator spasm and pelvic pain, like underlying back pain and hip pain. It's less good at effectively treating SUI and prolapse. You know, there's a couple different techniques that the PTs will teach patients for stress incontinence, like something called the knack, where the patients can kegel, cross their legs, and turn their bodies to the side, and it helps pull up their pelvic floor. It doesn't completely stop the leakage, but it decreases the amount of leakage that they experience with coughing, seizing, and valsalva. And then for prolapse, I counsel patients that the PT isn't going to magically retract the prolapse back up, but it will help in most of those cases where the leading edge of prolapse is right at the hymenal threshold, which is where patients become symptomatic, so they don't really feel it as much anymore. I've also encountered several patients that have strengthened their pelvic floor through performing core-centric exercises like karate or Pilates or bar and have experienced treatment. And then weight loss also improves pelvic floor disorders. So, Amy, so uh, in terms of, of the uh, SUEI, uh, stress incontinence, for sling procedures, who, who, is, who, who are you doing sling procedure versus a bulking agent? So, I think the bulking agents 
are good for patients who aren't really good candidates for a sling. So cancer patients, post-radiation patients, patients who've had healing issues like mesh erosions from a prior sling, women who desire future fertility or have a fixed urethra, or patients who are too sick to go to the OR. I think it's a good medium-term option. Basically, the data demonstrate from Europe when they compare the bulk amid urethral injections to the sling, pretty good results up to seven years, and they were like comparable. But the sling actually has longer term data up to 17 years. So I always counsel patients that if they want a more permanent solution to the incontinence, that the sling would be a better option. But I have some patients who have too much going on. They're busy. They like the idea of doing an office procedure or something quick in the surgery center. That's my practice. But I'm curious to hear what you, you've you been doing, because I think urology and urogynecology, sometimes we have a little bit different patient populations coming in. So I, I think no, more or less the same thing that you just said. I definitely ask the patient if they want to continue being active, because I'm still doing for when I, I, when I do TVTs, uh, I do the, the Advantage Fit. And I tell them that it's going to be three to four weeks of really no, nothing, no exercise. I know that might be changing, but if they want something that they can go back to their regular life faster, then the, the bulking agent, I think, is, a, is a, a, the bulk, I, mean, uh, I think it's a better option. And of, of course, if it doesn't work, you can either bulk it again or put a sling. I mean, that, that, yeah. that's, that's how I talk to the patient. No, yeah, it's I'm not true. not sure if I'm doing the right thing, but... No, it's totally true. And, and the downtime is a huge issue for patients. Previously, I was always hesitant to recommend urethral bulking agents because I just didn't feel like they worked very well. So a lot of times I would talk the patients out of it, even though I did mention it as an option in my standard surgical counseling. But the bulk of it is so much easier to inject and with longer lasting results. So I feel better about counseling and because I think it's a more legitimate option. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't do any bulking years before. I, I just started with the bulk. I mean, yeah, definitely, I mean, seven years, good results is better. I mean, I'm not going to be doing it every six months. So that's why I did more slings. But now with bulk, I mean, maybe, I think I, it's taken away from, from the patients that I did slings. Yeah. I still do a lot of slings, but I'm definitely doing more bulking agents than I ever did just because... You know, it's also easier to counsel patients about the fact that it's a hydrogel, it's 97% water, you know, 70 to 80% improvement for up to seven years. You know, the prior ones that I used, I used the uh, contagen, but having to do the skin testing for the bovine collagen reaction, uh, allergic reaction was a barrier. I never found coaptite to be that effective. And then when I would go back for repeat injections or placing a sling, the calcium hydroxyapatite material would often migrate or extrude. You know, I think that bulk of it probably does migrate a little bit. All of them do. But it's just a lot easier to use. And the patients have pretty good results immediately. Have you had, a, had to do any sling after a bulk of it? I did do one, yeah. And I did see a little bit of migration of the material into the trigone. Into a trigon, okay. Yeah. Did the patient have any overactive symptoms or, or, or dysuria no. or anything? No, we biopsied it and it was just like inflammation. Okay, okay. So no symptoms from that part. It was just that, that it mm -hmm. didn't work that much. Yeah. And in terms of the surgery, the technique, did you saw any difference or, or was it more challenging? No, but I have done, not with Bulkamid, but I have done a sling after coaptite and I did one on somebody who had had I think macroplastique and they do get sometimes like this it can either be gelatinous or like a pasty material underneath the urethra where you can tell where they injected along the mid urethra and up to the bladder neck the bulk of mid I, I didn't see that it had migrated more along a different tissue plane but I think now that we're using more bulk of it. I'm curious when I go back, what's going to happen. And definitely, I mean, yeah, the advantage of doing it in the office, I, I, I'm still doing it with sedation in the OR, but definitely the idea is to move towards the office. And, and it is an advantage, just, just like, I mean, like for Botox, that, that's, I think that's the benefit that you can do it in the office and be better. Yeah. One of my partners gave me a tip of like, 
doing periurethral injections for the urethral bulking in the office. So you just take like a 22 or 25 gauge needle and then you just inject some lidocaine along the urethra and that that really helps. And then for the Botox, I usually give both peridium and indwelling lidocaine for 20 to 30 minutes and those also help. So You also give peridium. It does, doesn't affect the visualization in the bladder? No, because you, you give it pretty, you know, you give it to them right at the time you, they have a negative urine dip and it's only like 20 or 30 minutes they're in the office. So, and it does help. It's definitely a very good analgesic. I throw everything at them. I'll even give them like a dose of Ativan, like 0.5 and like an oxycodone to bring to the office just to keep them out of the ASC every six months, you know. But some patients, they just want to have it in the ASC. But most of the time, I can do it Botox in the office, for sure. Do you do uh, rigid or flexible in the office? Rigid. But I mean, I, I, I have all the women. I, I know for you guys, it's different. Yeah, I, I, we, I, I use the flexible for both women and, and, and men. Uh, but definitely, I'm going to start using the Ativan. I, I don't give them anything. Just the lidocaine. But yeah, a friend of mine told me about the bulk. I mean, he, he essentially used the lidogel first and then uses the perirethral block, and he has been having great results. For sure. I think that that's, uh, all these little tricks are what help you achieve the patient satisfaction and analgesia in the office setting. It's just a totally different situation. Exactly. R right now I've been doing it ASC and it's, uh, we use Propofol and I use the, the, the block, the perirethral block, and they come out without any pain or anything. I think I had one that she had dysuria after the procedure, but after a couple of days, it was fine. Mm -hmm. So Amy, so in terms of, of uh, stress incontinence, what sling are you using? So I used to use the Boston Scientific Advantage Fit, like you mentioned. Now I use the Gynacare TVT Exact for the retropubic approach. For the TOT, I usually use the Boston Scientific Optrix. All the data support the bottom-up approach for the retropubic approach and the outside-in approach in terms of higher efficacy and less complications, you know, outside-in for the transoptrator approach. I think the most important thing is to get good at the sling that you choose because they're all slightly different in terms of handling and tensioning. How do you decide whether TBT or TOT? So, you know, I train mostly performing TOTs with the rationale that there's less bladder injuries and voiding dysfunction unless the patient shows evidence of ISD. But when I became an attending, my group was performing mostly retropubic switch slings, so I switched over at that time. I've definitely found that the paraurethral bands from the TOT mesh and the fornices can cause some dyspareunia, and it's easier to get a mesh erosion there. So, you know, there's been enough studies uh, and meta-analyses since I graduated fellowship in 2009 that have accrued enough power in terms of enough number of patients that show that the retropubic slings are more effective in addressing SUI compared to the transoptrator approach. The other side of the coin is, although they are more effective, they do have higher rates of voiding dysfunction and bladder injuries, like I mentioned. So, and then I don't really perform the mini slings. When I first came out of practice, I had to remove a bunch of the mini slings due to pain and dyspareunia from the pledgets into the obturator internus and just lack of efficacy in addressing the stress incontinence. There's a recent New England Journal of Medicine randomized trial. It was a non-inferiority trial in comparing slings to mini slings to either the TOT or, or TVT, like a full length sling. And this trial showed non-inferiority, but higher dyspareunia rates, 5% versus 12%, which definitely tracks with my experience. I'd rather put in a sling that works without causing issues. Uh, yeah, I guess now with the bulking agent, there's no, no, no reason for the mini sling. I mean, you can try the bulking agent, if not just put a regular sling. Yeah, I think that we had benefited from the data from Europe and the rest of the world, where a lot of the mesh slings were actually banned or taken off the market. So I think it accelerated the widespread use of, of Bulkamid. They have been very hot on the Bulkamid urethral injections. And now that it's rolled out in the U.S., I think we're seeing a lot of enthusiasm, just like you and I are, are pretty excited about it. I think a lot of other people are. The next frontier, I think, in terms of the, the bulking agents is the stem cell, the autologous injections. One of my colleagues at the clinic, Howard Goldman, is the PI, one of the PIs in the study, and I'm curious to see how that works. Yeah, that, that will be awesome. 
Yeah, I think a lot of research is going into that that field. For example, erectile dysfunction is a lot of promising data using that. So we'll have to see what, what where the stem cells go into the urinary tract. So Amy, in terms of booking agent or bocamid, what do you tell the patient what to expect after the procedure? I mean, what are the possible side effects from bulking agent? So I counsel the patients that it's 70 to 80% improvement for up to seven years. And usually people do well, but you know, when I sign the consent form, like there's bleeding, infection, urinary tract infection, and then some voiding dysfunction can also occur. I did have, a, when I first started doing Bulkamid, I had a couple of patients that couldn't void in the recovery room of the ASC. So they had to get straight cast and the hope was to pass the catheter so it would create a, a tract and the patient would be able to pee. And it's like a small catheter. I can't remember what it was, 12, like 12. Yeah, yeah. 12, 12 French. 12 French, yeah. yeah. 12 French. And then one of the patients still couldn't urinate. And then I had to send her home with a Foley. And then she came back in, she passed her void trial, and then she came in retention again, like 800 cc's or something. So then I started taking the voiding dysfunction a little bit more seriously because if you talk to the company, they're like, that never happens. <laughs> but, yeah, um, exactly. No, no. <laughs> Has that happened to you? No, but it was with a sling and it was recently. This patient, when I started the procedure, I put in the Foley catheter and she already had 900 in the bladder. Afterwards, I check out my notes. I mean, she never had elevated PVRs prior to surgery or anything in the office. So she developed retention. And I wasn't sure because of that episode that when I started the procedure, she already had 900. So I wasn't sure. But still, I took her to the OR and I, and I cut the sling on one side. And then she, she voided and she's doing fine. But I don't know how much of it it was from the anesthesia for the procedure. I, I don't know. Yeah, you know, and that's an interesting question. I think there are data showing that, like, when you perform a sling lysis, if you do it in the midline or you do it on the side, like, so it's more of a J configuration, you still get that mechanism, you know, of uh, the backstop. I, I do it on the side, just think, yeah. Yeah. So I think that the side actually makes sense. I haven't tried that method, but have you noticed that they still, you have, you achieve the continence and then the voiding? Yeah. The, yeah. I mean, I haven't had to do it often, but uh, yeah, the ones that I have done, they, they, they're fully continent. Oh, that's great. So they're happy. Yeah. So, so maybe the mini sling works somehow, but I don't know. But I mean, these are, have been TVTs, but if, if you're cutting one side, essentially mm -hmm. you're just leaving something there. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, sometimes who knows what exactly is going on in some patients. Just like that patient that had 800 of PBR. I mean, maybe it was the anesthesia. Who knows? Yeah. Or just, just, you know, they got over, over descended. Bladder rest for a while. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Because that patient, I, I leave my, 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 my slings with uh, one night uh, of, of a catheter. So she passed the voiding trial. So we always fill up the bladder and have her urinate. So she was voiding. So she wasn't in retention. I don't, I don't know. I mean, from the sling, I, I don't know. But still, I, I took her to the OR just in case. I didn't want to do a lysis a month after. So I, I'll, I just took her a couple of days afterwards. But she always passed her initial voiding trial and then she developed retention overnight. Yeah. It's, a, it's always funny when they pass the initial voiding trial and then they fail again, but it happens. It's, it's rare, luckily. But yeah, I, you, know, you don't have to wait for longer or if they can't urinate at all, I just cut it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's probably a mess afterwards. And you just t tell them, hey, we need to call yeah. They're not pleased because it's another time to the OR, yeah. but you know, it is what yeah, it is. Yeah, exactly. So for prolapse and incontinence, are, are you doing combined procedures or you prefer to treat one first and then see how it, how that person does? Well, if the patient doesn't desire surgical management, they can be fitted with an incontinent dish or ring with support and knob that reduces the prolapse and addresses the incontinence as well by providing support to the bladder neck. If the patient desires surgical management and has preoperative stress incontinence, then I counsel them that I can address both conditions at the same time. Because some patients may be wary or hesitant to have mesh plays, then I engage in shared decision-making and give them the option of preoperative urodynamics and concomitant sling at the time of prolapse repair or proceed with a stage approach. 
forego the preoperative urodynamics with interval sling placement if they become more bothered after prolapse repair. Occasionally, patients will not demonstrate stress incontinence on pre-op urodynamics, but I will counsel them on performing a concomitant sling anyway, since the data are supportive of that approach in terms of patient satisfaction, and also because, as we all know, urodynamics are an un- imperfect test. If the patient does not have preoperative SUI, then they still have a fairly high risk of developing de novo SUI postoperatively in the range of 40 to 50%. So I offer patients the same choices in terms of pre-op urodynamics and concomitant sling if it's positive for stress incontinence or the staged interval sling approach. But even though prolapse repair does not address incontinence per se, studies have shown that when you address anterior wall prolapse, urinary urgency does improve. And prolapse repair definitely helps with prolapse-related voiding dysfunction. I think the real danger area is for advanced prolapse that has caused longstanding bladder outlet obstruction, detrusor hypertrophy, and underactivity, and then the patient has SUI. So I would tread cautiously in that patient and possibly consider a bulking agent or a very loose sling. So exactly, and that, that's what I was going to mention, at least the very loose sling, because the first time that I had to cut a sling was a combined procedure. So at the, the GYN did the the AP repair and I did the, the sling and I left it like I always do. And that patient, they were attention. I then talk into a friend of mine. Yeah, you need to leave it much looser because when they do, they, they close the, the, the AP repair, the defect, it tends to tighten it up. So w- when you say looser, how do you create that? Do you leave a, a something in between the urethra and the sling to get that, that amount of loose loosening? Yeah, I, I use a curved mayos underneath the mid, mid urethra. And then I just make sure that I can just easily pass it between the, the mesh and the urethra. There was a Canadian RCT looking at, at mesh sling tensioning techniques and either using like an instrument. I can't remember exactly what they use. It was either a curved mayos or maybe it was a right angle or something. And then the other arm was using a Babcock. And I think the Babcock had a higher mesh erosion rates, which makes sense because it's a little bit of a knuckle of the sling that you leave out. So I just have always used the Mayo scissors underneath and then just making sure that it can pass easily. Okay. Yeah, I I use essentially a a female urethrodilator. I leave like a tench French, very small. I just put it there. I used to have the right angle. But just trying to keep it systematic and, and doing the same thing all over and, and make it, being able to measure the space. So, so I changed to the 10 French. So w- w- what type of prolapse uh, procedures do you do? So I do the vaginal approach as well as the laparoscopic approach. My go-to is the vaginal hysterectomy, bilateral self-injectomy, uterosacral ligament suspension, anterior posterior repair for those women who still have the uterus. But for select patients, you can talk about a hysteropexy with uterine conservation if they don't have a history of abnormal paps or cervical elongation or enlarged uterus with fibroids. I'll perform the vaginal uterosacral ligament suspension intraperitoneally, but sometimes occasionally I will perform a sacrospinous ligament hysteropexy. The advantage to the uterosacral ligament approach is that it preserves a natural axis of the vagina, whereas the sacrospinous ligament fixation stays extra peritoneal. It deviates the vaginal axis laterally and can cause buttock pain for up to six weeks. For post-hysterectomy patients, I'll offer either sacrospinous ligament fixation or laparoscopic sacral copopexy. For the high posterior prolapse, I actually think the sacrospinous ligament fixation works great. My approach is to take a diamond from the top and then just measure with Alice's, make sure that it goes up to the sacrospinous ligament and then shorten the vagina to where it doesn't just write on the sacrospinous ligament because I think it's the length that's very important there. For the predominant anterior and apical prolapse, I prefer laparoscopic sacrocopalpexy. That being said, I'll steer the patients towards the vaginal approach if they've had a lot of abdominal surgeries, they have a large history or large hernia repair with mesh, history of small bowel obstruction, contraindications to steep trendelberg like severe pulmonary disease, Contra indications to mesh like wound healing issues or significant comorbidities that preclude longer OR times associated with sacrocopalpexy. 
I usually counsel patients that prolapse repairs are, are like any other reconstructive surgery in the body, like an ACL tear or facelift or knee, hip replacements. And the natural history of the disease is that the connective tissue will weaken. Therefore, I, I usually reserve laparoscopic sacrocopopexy for those patients who are post-hysterectomy with anterior apical prolapse who have had a recurrence or want the most durable repair. I do perform primary sacral copopexy with concomitant hysterectomy or sacral hysteropexy in those patients who are young, like less than 40, who desire the most durable repair, but that's not my usual go-to. And does age, I mean, well, you mentioned the, the, the uh, less than 40-year-old, but older patient, older population, do you prefer vaginal? I mean, is it, is it something that you take into consideration, age of the patient between the vaginal and abdominal approach? Yeah, there's been studies looking at failure rates after vaginal versus the laparoscopic sacral cobopexy. And the vaginal approach risk factors for failure are age less than 60, stage three or four prolapse, and history of prior prolapse repairs. But I did, at the beginning of my career, start with doing a lot of primary sacral copalpexies. And I will say that over the course of my time as an attending, the field was shaped by the mesh litigation and patients became very hesitant about the placement of mesh. Now that the transvaginal mesh kits are taken for prolapse are off the market, I think it's a lot easier to counsel patients about it because sacral copalpexy has never been even mentioned during any of these warnings or targeted in any lawsuits or anything like that, or in terms of large multi-district litigation. But I just saw that patients evolved from being pretty receptive to sacral copalpexy to not wanting to even have a sling. So I have a whole counseling about the use of transvaginal mesh for slings, the, the use of mesh for sacral copalpexy. And I think for those who are younger and want to be kind of one and done, I think the sacral copalpexy makes more sense. I mean, you know, I tell people it's just like a hernia repair. It reinforces that area of weakness, whereas the vaginal repairs just use the stitches. So I often give that orthopedic analogy of a knee replacement versus just repairing your ACL. And patients, they understand. I think they're very savvy consumers of, of, of health information for the most part. And what about patients that are not sexually active? Does that change anything in your management? You know what? If they are not sexually active, I, I did not mention that there's a procedure called the cobochlysis, which if they have a uterus, you know, and they don't have any history of the abnormal paps or postmenopausal bleeding, it just leaves them with a shortened vagina in terms of the Lafort copoclasis. And then if they're post-hysterectomy, we can do a total, total copoclasis, which also leaves them with a shortened vagina. But those patients have very high cure rates, and it's a shorter procedure with very high patient satisfaction. I always document, though, about potential regret over not being able to be sexually active in the future. And for the properly selected patient, I think it's a great procedure. Yeah, they need to be sure that they're not sexually active, right? Right. And well, and also patients may not be sexually active, but they want that option to engage in that in the future or just the idea of it. The idea, yeah, yeah. So then I just, I think it, it's definitely a personal choice. Many women don't mind not being sexually active by the time they're older. So for them, I think they'll take you up on that offer. But um, a lot of women just want a, a, a different kind of procedure. So that's also fine. Amy, in terms of, I didn't ask you this, uh, for, for stress urine incontinence, do you vary or do you offer different type of treatments based on age? I mean, for example, if a 20-year-old person that already had three pregnancies, his stress urine incontinence, are, are you offering the same or are you doing something different? In those patients I would, who are very young, I do, and who want future fertility, I definitely would steer them towards an incontinence pessary or the bulkamid, urethral bulking injections. If they're done with childbearing, then I don't have a problem with putting in a, a sling. I did have a recent 
patient who presented in her late 20s and she had had a sling place and now she's pregnant. And I think it made sense looking at her chart and talking to the patient why she elected to proceed with a, with a sling, even though there, she, at the time she was nulliparous, because she said it was just so bothersome and really harmful to her self-esteem and her to quality of life. And actually, there's a really good American Urogynecologic Society clinical guideline on patients who have been treated with pelvic floor disorders, like a sling, and then recommendations for mode of delivery, like should they have a C-section. And basically, there's not enough data to recommend one approach or the other. But I did counsel her. She's a high risk of developing recurrent stress incontinence if she went to vaginal delivery or prolapse in the future if she had vaginal delivery. But even just pregnancy itself can can do that to you. And I don't think that there's enough data right now to support doing one or the other. And she also wanted to have three or four children. So the risk of cesarean and abnormal placentation in future pregnancies is definitely something to keep in mind. So that's something that we will definitely see. For the older patients, I think it really just depends also, you know, some patients are 45 and they they don't want to have a sling. And, and I think it just depends. And then it just depends on their comorbidities and whether or not they're able to go to the operating room, like I mentioned earlier. For that patient that you mentioned that had a, a sling, at, she was 27, she, she, she has another pregnancy. What do you counsel? I mean, do you counsel that, I mean, or do you need to take out the sling or just let it be and see what happens? Yeah, just let it be and see what happens. And a lot of times there's like a bunch of key series of a, a couple of patients who pregnant who got pregnant after sling placement and a lot of them do fine. Some of them do go into urinary retention and have to ha undergo sling lysis, but for the most part, they usually do pretty well. And for a patient that, let's say a, a young patient, also in the 20s, they get a sling, do you counsel them that, that, that in the future they might have high risk of, of needing another sling in the f 20 years from now? Or what do you tell them? Oh, yeah. Basically, like a lead time bias, right? Like we deal with this with tubal ligations, just a lot of women years. You know, if you tie someone's tubes when they're 25, I mean, you basically have another 20 years of fertility to guard against. Whereas if you're 45 and do tubal ligation, you don't have very long you know, to go to menopause. So the same thing with treating pelvic floor disorders. If you treat them early, you know, you have, you treat in their 20s, they have another 50 years of living. So they have a much higher chance for it to fail. It's just the time. So I try to under promise and over deliver and manage expectations. And then patients, they never really push back on it. They understand. I think they're Especially when I give that orthopedic surgery analogy, many of them have had orthopedic injuries, so like shoulder problems or knee replacements or hip surgery or whatever. So they understand that too. And I think in the past, people did promise that it would hopefully cure their prolapse. And I just have a different view of it. I'm like, it's, it, it's going to come back. This is reconstructive surgery. No reconstructive surgery in the body lasts forever. And uh, patients are like, okay, that's fair. Okay. I'm going to steal that one from you. <laughs> it's reconstructive surgery. <laughs> doesn't last forever. <laughs> it doesn't last forever. I mean, because then, you, you, you know, our group at the Cleveland Clinic has been in existence for over 25 years. Uh, Mark Walters is one of the founding fathers of urogynecology, and he was here since the mid-90s, maybe even the early 90s. So we're definitely seeing recurrences. And they had very good surgeries that lasted 20 years. The birch tilt couple suspension, the slings in the early 2000s, and, and it does come back. So I think counseling patients in a realistic manner is also important because then you, they don't feel like they ruined something or you did something wrong. It just hap it can happen. Exactly. So Amy, a a any last words to our listeners? No, I thank you so much. I, I really appreciate uh, being able to come on the podcast and to talk about one of my favorite 
topics. No, definitely. My, my, the pleasure is mine. And thanks for being here and, and, and giving your insights on these topics uh, as an expert that uh, you are. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team lead is Kieran Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Ishan Sangwan and Vidavi Patwardhan. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.